Hi everyone, I'm amazed to see what locations we have uh, today on the call. Australia, Sri Lanka, uh, kudos to you guys for joining the webinar. Thank you so much. Today we are going to talk about maximizing efficiency and security with zero trust continuous monitoring and automation. And today here with me, uh, my co-speaker is Jamie Sandbauer. And uh, we also have Brennan Bouchard helping us with answering your questions in the Q&A. So with that, um, what are we are going to cover today? We are going to do a little intro so that you know who your speakers are. And then we'll start by doing a little overview with about Zero Trust and the architecture and Cisco's approach to Zero Trust to kind of bring everyone on the same level. And then after that, we will dive deeper into some of the use cases uh, for establishing and continuously verifying trust, as well as responding to change in trust using different uh, security solutions, tools, and um, automation. So, and then after that, we'll come back for a summary and Q&A. So with that, uh, I would like to start by just introducing myself to this audience. Uh, I've been with Cisco for almost 15 years, uh, over 18 years in the industry. For the past five years, I've was, I, I'm part of a global security architecture team. And uh, Jamie is my former colleague on the team as well. Uh, my specialty is security APIs, automation, and orchestration. I'm also leading a security programmability team, which Brennan is part of. And uh, overall, we talk to customers on a daily basis about their automation use cases and how we can leverage APIs, um, automation, and different orchestration tools to help our customers to achieve the security outcomes they are looking for. So with that, I would like to pass over to Jamie for the introduction. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening to everyone. My name is Jamie Sambauer. I'm a principal architect for Modern Cyber. I'm actually a former Cisco uh, principal architect. I worked with Oksana for many years and I was one of the Zero Trust advisors. Um, and today at, at Modern Cyber, I work with a lot of Cisco customers and partners. And we have a focus around Zero Trust automation, really taking a, a modern approach inclusive of integrations, agility, and security operations, and applying zero trust principles uh, for customers' architectures and environments. And obviously you can use some of the QR codes and connect with me on LinkedIn or check out some of the modern cyber information as well. Uh, before we uh, jump too much into some specific use cases that are gonna help enable Zero Trust outcomes, we thought it would be good to do a quick review on some of the standards and some of the, the driving factors for Zero Trust for a lot of the enterprises and even commercial and small customers out there. Uh, with that, one of the biggest challenges that we can continue to see is this hybrid multi-vendor, multi-vector universe where you know essentially complexity becomes this enemy number one. Uh, and how do we see complexity in environments? It comes down to technical debt, the data that is incorporated within the IT and security infrastructure, and also how much change is naturally occurring. New applications, new devices, new use cases all the time. And with that, everyone within the organization is an insider. And so you have to protect uh, wh whether they're at home, whether they're at, at a local cafe, or even at an organization's location, they're always uh, treated as an insider, especially as it relates to data. And because of these factors, attacks can start from anywhere, and we've seen that. And you know, nine times out of 10, the concept behind alert fatigue is much worse than it has been in the past. It doesn't, it, it hurts me very much so when I see, you know, news articles for big breaches and the alert was there, but no one was able to respond to it in time or no one was able to highlight and prioritize that alert to actually take action. And the the other point we, we like to talk about is the fact that no matter how hard some of the commercial real estate investors would like, hybrid work is here to stay. We're going to see employees moving from at home to in the office very frequently. And it's not, it, that that model is not changing anytime soon. And one, uh, I'll say a few years back, you probably heard of this use case. I still think it's a, a pretty great one to think about, which 
you know, when we're thinking about threats and how they affect uh, organizations, not Petya was one that was a, a very challenging threat for many organizations. But one of the larger multinational companies, you can read uh, about not Petya affecting them. But the point that I always like to bring up is kind of putting yourself in that security operators or analyst shoes. And when they actually addressed or or had to deal with NotPetya, in seven minutes, they saw all of these problems occur. Not seven days, seven weeks, seven months, but in seven minutes, we saw 49,000 laptops go down uh, and, and that not Petya variant hit all 49,000 laptops. About 1,200 of their applications were inaccessible and 1,000 were destroyed. Some of the data was uh, preserved on backups, but couldn't be restored because of the state that the servers themselves, the applications themselves were left in. And even 3,500 of the 6,200 servers were completely destroyed. Uh, all to make matters worse, all fixed phone lines were inoperable. So they had voice over IP, but because the malware was spreading so rapidly and creating so much latency on the network, the phone system didn't work. And imagine yourself, you're trying to pick up the phone and call your boss or call another coworker to figure out what's going on. You can't make that phone, uh, phone call. And then you pick up your cell phone and to make matters worse, all of their contacts within these cell phones were erased because uh, it had synchronized with Outlook, which actually went down and had actually um, didn't have access to all those contacts from a data standpoint. So imagine this, you're waking up, you get this uh, alert and immediately everything just starts going down. Now, I don't care how fast you type. I don't care how many uh, widgets you have that flash on your screen when a threat occurs. No human can combat this type of attack manually. So it really proves kind of the need for proactive orchestration and automation uh, to be able to address and respond to these types of threats. And when it comes to zero trust, it really does provide a great architecture for defense of some of the sophisticated and even nation state attacks. Now, one of the challenges that we saw uh, with Zero Trust originally was everyone kind of had a different view of what Zero Trust should be. Uh, a few years back, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, based in the United States came out with 800-207 to define Zero Trust architecture in more detail. Now, the biggest callouts from uh, NIST 800-207 is that Zero Trust is not just this architecture, but really a, a set of guiding principles for workflow, system, and operational design to help organizations improve the, the holistic architecture within security. Now, when I look at this diagram, I think a couple of things, and, and really as developers, I wanted you to, to peel back the onion a little bit and think about some of the burning practical questions around implementation. And when we look at 80207, you should hopefully start to think about, well, with this architecture, we've got a policy engine, we've got policy distribution points, and then we have all of these inputs. So all of those lines on the outer perimeter of that circle represent integrations of different data and information within a zero trust architecture. So if you're not familiar, CDM stands for uh, Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation. It's a fancy way of looping together vulnerability management, patch management, mobile device management. So even that one box could represent five or six different integrations for an enterprise. And these are where some of the questions should come come in into your mind, which is, you know, for your organization, how many policy decision points are there? Uh, I, even the smallest organizations uh, out there will have at least a handful of policy decision points. You have a firewall, you have an identity system like Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, Okta, uh, Duo, et cetera. So you're going to have multiple policy decision points that you have to create, maintain, and, and distribute policy with. 
The other big question is, you know, policy information points, all of these systems that have to feed a zero trust architecture to establish trust and to maintain trust. That's a lot of uh, integrations and more specifically, a lot of data merging that has to occur for that to work well. The other big question is how many different operational groups within your environment actually own these different systems? Because that's a bigger challenge that we start to see across the world is, you know, well, while practically we could integrate some of these systems, how many different teams do I need to work with to even be able to get the rights, the API keys, all of the background to actually make those integrations work? And the last one really comes about is uh, in the world of least, uh, of least privilege, where we're trying to create just enough access for users or devices or applications, how is an organization supposed to operationalize zero trust? And I, I like to add a, a single point here, which is, you know, not only operationalize zero trust, the policy, the integrations, but how do you do that without adding 50 or 100 additional staff members that can take on that additional work? And this is, this is really, uh, when we break down this problem, as a developer, you're hopefully immediately starting to think about it in this type of diagram. Well, if we take NIST 80207, we start to develop or, or break out the different policy decision point areas around user security, device security, network, apps, and data. Now I have all of these individual integrations, and this is a a simplified view, right? Because like I mentioned, CMDB, enterprise mobility management, mobile device management, patch management, typically those are all different systems that you have to integrate into. Now, one thing that uh, we've done for many customers that does help with this is it becomes overwhelming extremely quickly. Uh, so a lot of times we've worked with customers to help prioritize their zero trust strategy and roadmap. And we do so by being able to establish some form of baseline. So documenting current zero trust architecture and zero trust maturity. One of the challenges with zero trust is every organization might make their definition a little bit differently. Uh, and in that you have to start with some form of baseline. As I mentioned, you're going to have maybe 10, be 20 different policy decision points. So how, how are they configured today? What does the policy look like today? Where are there already integrations established that are going to help you get to a stronger or more optimal zero trust maturity? And where does the organization's security architecture need to go in order to fill those gaps to have that optimal zero trust state? And this is one that um, whether you're doing it yourself, you're going out and getting help, it's the first step. You don't just start configuring integrations. You start by prioritizing uh, the gaps and determining the right uh, strategic roadmap for your organization. Now, one big uh, poll question, since we've introduced this concept of policy information and decision points, how many policy decision points does your organization have? A uh, quick poll, you can see it in your in your WebEx right now, uh, and you can vote on how many you believe your organization might have. Okay, so I, I do see, Oksana, we've got 48% so far saying I don't know, 26% uh, or so saying 15 plus. Uh, and this actually brings up another thing that you've talked about quite a bit, Oksana, which is the average organization having 50, 75 plus different security tools and the need for orchestration and automation. That's right. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, so as we talk about the policy in general and places where we would like to automate, the first thing we definitely need to think about the desired outcomes, right? And as we're talking about the policy, as you have seen, the, 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 the policy is evolving, right? It's not network-centric or location-centric anymore. It is very much user-centric and application-centric. And the policies need to be synchronized, right? They have to be consistent. They have to be dynamic. We even more so need the visibility and control capabilities to make sure that we do get to those uh, 
fully impl implement uh, zero trust principles that Jamie has described in the uh, NIST section, right? And we are all living in the hybrid cloud world, right? We don't need to, uh, we should not forget that um, our users can be everywhere, right? Or anywhere and same with our applications. And so we really need to, uh, the main struggle is right now to maintain that consistency and get that level of um, uh, visibility across all of our infrastructure. So uh, right now, I, I would like to touch base a little bit on Cisco's approach to zero trust, right? We have looked at the uh, challenges and the outcomes the uh, the customers are looking for, and also at the standards and frameworks that has been developed for zero trust architecture. And then uh, for um, Cisco's zero trust architecture, we're leveraging, obviously, uh, the very um, broad portfolio of our security solutions. And we're matching that to the industry principles so that we can provide our customers with desired outcomes. So there are three main pillars that we have, the user and device security, network and cloud security, and application and data security. And uh, they're all based on the view that you might have at the zero trust. And that's really depends on which team you're a part of, right? So if you're on the network team, for you, that will be about network control, visibility, and segmentation. For uh, identity and access team, that will be about um, identity-based policies and uh, privileged access management. And then for SOC team, and that's partially a bigger focus for our discussion towards the end of the session as well, is um, how do the threats and new um, compromises that I see in my organization will impact the trust level, the zero trust level, and how I can dynamically change um, the uh, level of trust to my users based on the new context that I see in my environment. So uh, combining all of that, you see that regardless of the pillar that you're focusing on and the use cases that you're focusing on, there, the, there are four main steps that are generally the same, right? First, you need to establish trust to your users or your devices or the services and applications, and then be able to assess the posture and context, right? And then based on that trust level that you determine, you, you will apply and enforce certain policy, right, dynamically. And then after that, you need to keep continuously verifying trust, reassess your environment, take new signals, take shared signals from other tools and sources across silos to be able to respond to potential changes in trust so that you don't get the impact as the in the example that Jamie shared at the beginning of the presentation, right? Um, and the key here is automation, right? You will not be able to achieve these outcomes without leveraging the automation capabilities. And uh, from Cisco perspective, this is where SecureX comes in, and we will talk a little bit more about that. But generally, SecureX um, acts as an API aggregation points, taking signals, threat intelligence, context, visibility from all different uh, tools, um, providing a single point for visibility right, and threat investigation. And it also has a built-in automation and orchestration tool, which allows you to automate uh, different tasks uh, across all of those four main steps that we have covered already, right? Because there's plenty of opportunity for automation of different operations related to all these uh, four large steps that we have covered in this um, few slides. So to conclude this session, one important uh, key thing here is that regardless of the framework that you're relying on uh, right now, whether it's NIST or CISA that was covered in the first session of this series by Brennan, uh, or you're leveraging Cisco's approach because you're largely using uh, our solutions, potentially, there are common themes. And those common things is you gotta have visibility, right? You gotta have uh, shared context to be able to uh, uh, analyze it. And you have to use automation and orchestration so that you can get to the zero trust outcomes. And so um, all of that brings us to the point that once you have all of that, then we can talk about zero trust maturity. And this is where we would like to ask you, how do you assess your company's zero trust maturity level? Um, if, you can, if, you can, um, if you can say that 
you know, confidently that you know what is your company's, your trust's maturity level or not. Cool. And as they, as they're answering it, it keeps flipping, flipping back and forth between uh, more no's than yeses. It does look like it's pretty close, about 56%, no, 40%, yes. So a lot of people haven't really defined uh, maturity yet for their organization. And one one note uh, while people are finishing up the poll is uh, CISA actually released their version 2.0 of the uh, CISA Zero Trust Maturity Model. And this does provide a great framework that you can read through, that you can work through to define uh, your organization's current maturity. And it's one that, uh, depending on where you're at and the journey, you might be at that uh, early stage or even optimal in, in other stages. The other call out I like to make on maturity, if you do read CISA, is if you don't have orchestration, automation, and analytics, there is zero way that you can define yourself as an optimal maturity. So that's probably another good proof point if you're working internally with uh, different stakeholders to really make the case that zero trust depends on orchestration automation uh, to, to make it real. Thanks everyone who was able to, to submit their uh, information on the poll. At this next section, we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking through how with Cisco's model, uh, you can establish and continuously verify trust. And this really is the those first two stages as Oxada was mentioning uh, to the zero trust journey. One thing that I always like to remind folks is you can't establish trust if you don't know what you're looking for. And I always, when we're working with different customers on zero trust, and how to build policy, it starts with data. You have to know what your inventory is and know every entity out there. You need to generally know the communication patterns of those devices. Is it 80% SaaS and 20% internal or vice versa? Who's talking to what? And then from that, you can start to establish what is normal. If you let someone write up a baseline of what trust should equal to uh, just without data, they're going to define best practices and maybe only 20% of the organization is going to meet that. So you have to understand what that baseline is, understand what is normal, and then you can start to establish and be al alerted to change and create some form of res response mechanism to uh, threats and changes in trust, which we'll talk about in our next section. Now, me personally, I grew up in uh, Maryland in the United States, and I always grew up going to amusement parks and county fairs and state fairs and those kind of things. And as a kid, uh, you end up having uh, that experience where if you get that wristband, uh, you're able to ride anything you want. Well, that's not completely true. You have to be able to be a certain height in order to ride certain rides. I find this to be a great analogy to establishing device trust. How will your organization define trust? Uh, many times the best practice here is to define a uh, two or three categories of trust. Uh, maybe a BYOD type device needs a certain level of protection, whereas a managed endpoint would need another level of, of protection. And you can also build in some of the behavior-based information as well. Um, so in that same analogy, we might say, well, if your device has security agents, it's running the latest software patches, it's got the minimum OS version, and we've got encryption on it, let's go ahead and call you a low trust device. If we haven't seen any indications of compromise and it's a managed machine, you, you get to that high trust level and by establishing a defined baseline of trust, then we can use that trust level in policy. And that's where things get really interesting here, uh, which is once we've established trust, we can start to extend that trust into the different policy decision points. And one of my favorite things to do, or really a, almost a prerequisite to getting policy right, is to extend that trust and some level of dynamic context into those policy engines. 
And why is this so important? Why is this critical for organizations to do? Because otherwise, policy is going to change thousands or tens of thousands of times every day or week, uh, depending on the size of your organization. Today, uh, my device is trusted. Tomorrow, it's not. How do I change the level of access without changing a firewall rule or a rule in Duo or a rule in Azure AD? I can't. So one of the real big innovations here is uh, how Cisco's built this almost fabric of sharing of information across uh, the different policy inf information and enforcement points. And then in this example, we see four typical uh, areas where you might want to apply policy. Uh, users in the campus connecting to cloud, a private data center, or another branch. Uh, branch connecting to data center, or cloud, etc. In all of these examples, if we've gotten that trust established and we have contextual data, we can share it across these different control plane points so that there's no ACL reconfiguration required uh, as the user might move to different locations or need to uh, access different resources. And to me, this is an, a big part of that, how I achieve zero trust without having to add a ton of people. Well, I got to be able to make use of the tools I have. A uh, great couple examples I have coming up here. Um, the first one I wanted to, to kind of convey is sharing trust from Cisco's identity services engine. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with ICE, ICE is uh, network access control, but it does a lot more than that by being able to stop and interrogate devices. It creates a great uh, device database of users, devices, their posture context. Uh, it also can determine if uh, it's a managed device or a BYOD device. Now, one of the cool things here is there is a native integration between ICE and Cisco Secure Workload so that we can uh, share the trust level and share context so you're not duplicating those capabilities and you're not having to write policy that is going to have to change every time a user might move location or uh, establish a need to access a different application. And so in this diagram, you can kind of see the way this works, which is as uh, something like ICE is authenticating users, it's giving that real-time state information up to secure workload so that they're able to enforce policy based on all of that different context. And, you know, I'll give you a couple quick examples. One, if I'm a managed machine uh, with a managed trusted user on it, connecting to a financial application and private data center or even in public cloud, this would allow the Cisco Secure Workload to enforce that only a high trust device as encryption is up to date, hygiene's great, to be able to access that uh, application. As soon as that device changes trust, we see an indication of compromise, there's a threat. We can dynamically change the access to that resource. And when you look at zero trust, this is what really you have to get to to meet that optimal state and to uh, be able to enforce based on trust itself. Now, it doesn't stop there. Um, one of the couple more call outs here, uh, the same way ICE can share that context with something like uh, Cisco Secure Workload, it also can share it natively with uh, Cisco Secure Firewall and the Firewall Management Center, which then allows you to scale uh, the way that you're sharing context between different devices. Now, as a developer, what you should be thinking is, well, the same way that ICE is sharing this information with other Cisco components, uh, the big benefit there is you don't have to do that native uh, coding to make that work. It, these are also open APIs on both sides. So depending on how the organization has established uh, different security tools in their stack, you could easily replicate and simulate the same type of integrations with third-party components. That work obviously just becomes something that you have to do versus something that Cisco has now provided and supports. And the, the last one I wanted to uh, give you an example of because it comes up all the time too is 
Okay, I'm using something like Cisco Secure Workload to uh, establish trust of my different workloads, whether they're public or private cloud, whether they're virtual machines, containers, uh, bare metal servers. But I also have a firewall that's outside of the control of Cisco Secure Workload. So the same way that we establish some of the trust of users, devices, and workloads, we're able to share the context between a secure workload and a firewall to be able to use that same context. So firewall traditionally is going to be based on IP addresses, object groups, which are groups of IP addresses, and it's not dynamic. You need a new rule, a user needs a new level of access. It's all manual. Uh, most organizations are still using help desk tickets to convey a policy chain. In this world of zero trust, we establish trust. We then can share that trust information, in this case, workload information, back to the firewall that's enforcing it. And immediately, any changes occur, it's going to be uh, dynamic. No need for a change window, a configuration change, et cetera. And if you haven't taken a look at some of the great learning labs around secure workload in DevNet, there's a few that kind of expose how open uh, secure workload is for creating your own uh, flows, policy pipelines, objects, and sharing of trust. So all of these different components, while we're giving you specific examples, are completely open from an APIs and orchestration standpoint for you to be able to um, mature the way that you integrate or process policy and integrate other third-party components that your organization has to make these same use cases work at scale. Now we're going to have Oxada kind of jump in. So once you've established trust and been able to apply policy, the question is, as threats occur, how does Cisco security and some of these APIs help us get to uh, a dynamic response to change in trust. Thank you, Jamie. That last use case that you shared, I still do remember how we uh, worked on the proof of concept five years ago, uh, leveraging the open APIs of uh, each solution to prove to our engineering that we do that uh, need that native integration. So that brings really good memories about the good old times. Well, um, talking about the response, right, and talking about uh, continuously monitoring and verifying our environment and being able to dynamically respond to any changes. Um, we, I want to talk about the need of a solution that provides you with extended detection and response capabilities, because that's essentially a solution that will be uh, critical to achieving those outcomes and, uh, um, you know, addressing those use cases. Right. Um, so, uh, what we uh, what we think uh, about this as a Cisco, right? The key components of the solution, uh, in general, the uh, industry recognized at that, and that we also provide uh, in a solution that we are offering right now is um, extended. Means that the, the solution needs to take telemetry and threat intelligence from all different sources, including third parties, right, to be able to combine. Uh, signals that you're seeing from uh, coming from all the different detection tools and threat intelligence tools that you're leveraging uh, for your security operations. And then the second is, as I mentioned, detection, which is very key. Um, um, according to Sun surveys, um, very often organizations are relying on uh, um, detection tools to uh, make, um, you know, to investigate what's already has been detected in their organization and to be able to proactively address those threats. And it's very important to take um, all the intelligence and analytics that are available to you to be able to answer the question, do I really care? And Jamie talked about alert fatigue previously. So these tools should be able to really help you correlate different signals that you see, apply um, um, internet-wide threat intelligence knowledge to it to be able to for, to help you um, efficiently prioritize what we really need to look at. And then finally, response actions, um, a single aggregation point from where you can conduct all of your response actions is critical to for um, efficient responses, right? And that uh, time to uh, respond and remediate um, capabilities that we are looking for. 
Right. Uh, and so from Cisco's perspective, right now we are offering SecureX as a platform with XDR capabilities and SOAR capabilities as well. And I'll touch base on that in a, a couple of moments. This slide just highlights how from uh, Cisco's perspective, uh, uh, we have the tools that are matching together, right, to provide you all of those um, capabilities that I mentioned before, right? But essentially, all of those tools are there for you to achieve the following outcomes, right? You need to be able to detect fast across multi-vendor environment uh, and multi-vector environment uh, the different signals that you see from network, from your cloud, from endpoint, email, um, correlate those signals and then being able to act on them um, fast enough, right? Not in seven days and seven uh, months, but potentially faster than in seven minutes <laughs> in some cases, right? And then the second, the third um, pillar here you see is uh, generally leveraging automation to elevate your productivity by automating routine operations, eliminating human errors, um, triggering certain automations um, based on, you know, dynamic changes in your environment. And then all of that will essentially allow you to uh, strengthen the, the overall security posture of the organization and um, and mature your uh, zero trust architecture, mature your um, threat hunting practices and your overall security practice as well. And so um, right now, as I mentioned, we have the platform that's called SecureX, which provides um, those capabilities, um, the core technologies. Next week at the RSA, we are going to announce an evolution to this platform which um, builds on top of um, core technologies from SecureX, but also brings you much closer to achieving those outcomes by including um, additional capabilities, right? Uh, including more of a third party and multi-vector detection and context capabilities, including um, correlation engines, um, AI engines to really help you, um, you know, streamline the journey shorten the journey and bring, you know, um, ele uh, elevate time to value, right, for you. So uh, please uh, look out for the announcement at the RSA next week um, because that tool will um, greatly um, expand what SecureX has to offer today. With that being said, um, SecureX um, does have great capabilities. And it's included with any Cisco technologies uh, that you uh, already own right now, right? And it brings together the context, threat intelligence, and provide you with automation and orchestration capabilities, right? Um, and that will all um, be available in the EU solution that we're announcing next week. So one important key point to all of that is SecureX has its own APIs which allows you to integrate it into uh, other tools and other systems that you use um, to uh, conduct, you know, that you use in your SOC, right, for your security operations. Pretty much everyone is using SIEM. Pretty much, pretty much um, everyone is using ITSM systems, right, IT service management systems and security incident and event management systems. Um, and then uh, security operation, orchestration and automation and response systems as well. So leveraging SecureX APIs, you can integrate its great capabilities, right? That consolidated threat intel, consolidated context, consolidated response capabilities uh, from Cisco and third party tool set into those other tools that you're leveraging. So that without leaving the con console of your service now, for example, you can enrich and bring context from SecureX into uh, an incident or event that you're looking at at the moment. Um, same with Splunk, right? You can leverage SecureX capabilities and its APIs to bring um, in uh, real time uh, additional enrichment and context and then correlation capabilities into your um, Splunk console. So um, that's a great way to um, elevate the value and efficiency of your SOC, leverage SecureX capabilities here. 
And so um, another component that I want to make sure I touch base on is uh, the orchestration tool, which is a built-in capability within SecureX, which allows you to build your own workflows and break silos and come up with the use cases uh, for orchestration across tools that were not possible before. So essentially leveraging the APIs, you unlock those, you know, endless capabilities to make anything that fits your own operations possible without waiting for a vendor to develop an integration for a year or come up with a new feature that may not be exactly what you wanted that to be in the first place or your requirements change in that time, right? By leveraging the APIs and this built-in orchestration, the, the velocity of your projects and, the, and um, you, the, the speed you're getting to the outcomes will grow exponentially. Um, with that, you'll be able to trigger those workflows either manually or scheduled or through the webhooks or through the email or um, um, other triggers or through SecureX APIs. Right, and they allow you to integrate not only with cloud-based solutions, but also with on-premises solutions. So it really covers uh, a great, um, you know, ninety-nine percent of the tool set that you are leveraging in the, your organization. So remember, the automation is key to um, getting to zero trust maturity, and uh, this kind of tool w would be instrumental to achieving those outcomes. With that, very often, and Jamie mentioned that a lot of customers don't know where to start, right, or need additional training. That's another trend that we see from SANS uh, threat hunting surveys, for example. The biggest um, barrier to achieving maturity uh, for the organization and security sphere is lack of training. So we do offer training. Um, there are certain locations that we're addressing right now, and um, uh, we are, uh, we are, um, Please use that QR code to check if there is an event that's close to where you are right now. There's going to be more events coming up globally. And so uh, in the training, we will pro we will teach you the key skills and uh, capabilities that are necessary for you to be um, effective in building these operations. So uh, with that, I would like to dive into a specific use case in the demo. And uh, the, for the, the use case we will be looking at is how we can leverage APIs and automation to uh, isolate a malicious endpoint based on some uh, anomalous behavior. In this example, we are looking on like a generic use case, right? The, the, you, you, you would want to look at information that comes from your network as well from uh, the context that comes from your multi-cloud environment then you would want to uh, enrich that data with information that you get from other security tools and detection tools, such as email security tool, your uh, endpoint detection and respond tool potentially, uh, right? And then you would like to take all of that information and dynamically uh, change trust level to that user or that device by leveraging the orchestration capability. And so that's essentially what we will be doing by looking at this specific example. In this case, we're investigating an event of an unusual user activity from an unusual location. And then we're uh, doing additional enrichment, trying to find more context about the user and its device. And if uh, after that, we make decision that we need to change the, le uh, the trust level for that user. And while we're investigating further what's going on, we, we are disabling the, the user in the um, um, Azure Active Directory uh, while, and, and we're notifying the user about this um, action. So with that, let's uh, take a look at the demonstration. Um, right now, we're looking at SecureX screen, and uh, this is the case book where we are collecting all the data to uh, come up, um, you know, to, to collect um, information about uh, investigation that's going on right now. We have fetched um, Microsoft Graph security event via the API and created this SecureX casebook uh, where we will be collecting all the threat intelligence and notes and collaborate on this uh, investigation. So the first question we need to answer, do we really care? And uh, um, what we are looking here is we have information about the user that we also fetched from the Active Directory. It looks like a, a, a pretty important user, the VP of sales uh, here um, named Julia, 
uh, has uh, an uh, unusual login event from Amsterdam, Netherlands, while this user's uh, usual office location is uh, United States. And so what we want to do next is um, this information came uh, to us through leveraging SecureX orchestration. Um, right now, you see I have jumped over to that screen, and you see it's it's a, a block scheme-based, drag-and-drop-based uh, interface. And all of those activities uh, leveraging respective APIs are pre-built for you. So you can just provide the input and output, um, output parameters and AP keys and and schedule that workflow to run so that when there's certain unusual activity happens, the case would get created for you automatically. We see that we also did the um, enrichment with threat response, and we found a device that is associated with this user, um, leveraging device insights component of SecureX. And we also saved the results of that investigation and attached that to the original casebook. So all of that has been done for us automatically, even before the analyst has looked at this casebook at all and started an investigation. So if we jump to uh, the link that brings us to the user's device, we can see that uh, what's the IP address of this device and um, this, the context that we have obtained from multiple different tools. We see that the firewall is disabled here. Um, the state of policy rules is poor. This device has some vulnerabilities and then um, there's certain detection tools and detection tools that are disabled on this device. Um, we can also see full information about the specific computer, and all of that comes from the MDM solution, from an EDR solution, um, including uh, a OS query um, orbital component of uh, Cisco Secure Endpoint. So we have consolidated context from multiple tools, and um, what we can also do, we can fetch the IP address of this device. I mean, we could automate it, but then it would be a pretty fast demo, right? So I have to show you a little bit of the UI. Um, so what we are doing is we're diving into Talos Threat Intelligence to find information about um, this um, computer IP address. And we can see that it's based in US. So that login activity for that user from another location really becomes suspicious and we want to investigate it further. So while we're doing it, we want to disable that user's access to our cloud application and we disable that user in um, uh, Azure Active Directory. And this is a custom response action that we made available in our uh, pivot menu. We have created this workflow. It is an orchestration workflow. As you can see, it ran successfully. And if I uh, click on that, um, you will see that um, it's, it's again a drag and drop user interface. So just to verify that the action has been completed, we see the user was disabled. Now we could add to that one click action additional things. We could revoke the sessions for this user. We could reset pa uh, passwords for this user. We also included notifications actions by bringing the WebEx message to the user, notifying about potential risks that um, we are seeing related to their activity. And so um, all of that is enabled by the automation uh, component of a SecureX. Now, uh, to come back to what we covered in this demo, I hope we were able to showcase how um, automation and leveraging the open APIs of your solutions is key to, for you to uh, look at those um, last two pillars, right? Continuously uh, assessing and verifying trust to uh, your uh, organization, users, assets, applications, devices, and being able to automatically respond to change in trust um, by leveraging um, tools and components that you have at your availability. So with that, we would like to um, get to the last poll question uh, for today, which would be, um, what do you say that your architecture allows you to respond to change in trust and apply that automatically. And while we're waiting for the results, I think um, I will uh, hand over to Jamie at this point to get us to the final section of um, this um, of the series. Uh, I see that we still have people responding. We have 34 responses so far. And uh, <clears throat> um, I see that majority of the answers that we have is 
that sure is the the largest amount of responses that we see so far um which is which is pretty fair right and this is why we're actually having the session so with that jamie would you like to uh, uh thanks thanks Oksana, and great demo um so thanks everyone for for hanging in there with us for this last hour uh we did start off the day looking at a uh, zero trust framework from NIST. so we walk through 800-207 with you. Uh, and then Atsana explained kind of how Cisco's matching up for uh, their architecture to the NIST 800-207, as well as some of the CISA standards. Uh, we also looked into why continuous monitoring and automation are important to zero trust security programs and what outcomes uh, organizations want to achieve with them. And, and while we didn't go extremely detailed into uh, individual use cases. A lot of the examples we gave you were to hopefully help you understand how important sharing of context are. And then finally, Oksana took us through some great ideas behind responding to changes in trust. So how Cisco uses and leverages XDR to enable uh, automation and monitoring of the infrastructure. And whether it be leveraging SecureX or another uh, SOAR oriented tool, the methodology of process is going to be similar, right? What Oksana presented is that uh, process that an organization might want to orchestrate from start to finish when they see some form of real threat occur in their environment. Thank you, Jamie. The last thing we want to cover is uh, there's some additional um, resources we would like to share including the channel that we have where we share a lot of demonstrations of very specific use cases and automation um, that you can see there in the video play, uh, playlist sections that we strongly recommend you to take a look because everyone's operations are different. Everyone's environment is so different. And uh, we, we're trying to uh, share more demos and use cases with you on a regular basis so that you find something uh, useful for your organization. We also have pre-built playbooks um, that you can look at in our library. They're based on the most common use cases that we see, um, and uh, we encourage you to take a look at. And then with that, I uh, would like to um, bring us back to questions. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Oksana, so the, the first one that I'll throw out there that just came in through the chat um, it is SecureX vendor agnostic? It definitely is. It's a very open platform that allows for integration with third party tools as well. In fact, we right now have more third party integrations that Cis than Cisco integrations with SecureX. And uh, I mean, there is no vendor lock in. Anyone can develop against the framework that we have. We have an integration template builder. Uh, which allows you to uh, to integrate with any tool that is relevant for your organization and then host that um, integration to to be able to leverage that with your SecureX um, instance. Awesome. Kind of along, along that same line, um, the, the next one that I have is said, uh, is this SecureX that Oxana is presenting uh, similar to a SOAR and what's features that Splunk can do. Um, so I think kind of if we could compare and contrast a little bit as far as functionality where SecureX sits and how it's you know, slightly different from Splunk as we look at it. Right, so SecureX is not a lock collector similar to Splunk, right? It takes um, a point in time investigation, reaching out to respective APIs of each product um, in point in time, and it provides you with response actions as well, right? Um, in the evolution that we will see coming over uh, next week, you will see a lot of a lot more of the correlation capabilities. So, um, SecureX does not eliminate you the need of a SIM, which you would use to collect all of your logs, but it uh, enhances those capabilities for for you to be able to leverage automation and. Uh, um, bring visibility in from all the other different tools and um, all the other different contexts, including threat intelligence and response capability. 
and we do have information the, the Splunk. Yeah, well, and and actually, that's it. The Splunk piece is an interesting point. Uh, because it, it kind of can work both ways. So being able to use the SecureX intelligence within Splunk or being able to use Splunk as a data source within SecureX. So there's a lot of different ways that that, that can be leveraged. Um, that's awesome. Exactly. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, another one's coming through, you know, where is, you know, with Zero Trust being, uh, you know, kind of a key priority for so many organizations, where is a good place to start? Uh, Jamie or, or Oksana, uh, if you want to jump in there. Yeah, I, I, I can jump in there. I've worked with tons, probably hundreds of different customers on this question. And it ends up being that something that's a little bit subjective, depends on security outcomes that are desired, IT outcomes that are desired. I've worked with some customers that try to focus on uh, areas where they're less mature in. So, hey, we're, we, we haven't really uh, put the time or effort into cloud security yet. Let's uh, start our journey there. And then I've also worked with some customers that focus on uh, areas where they've got a little bit established, but they just want to uh, jump over that last couple hoops to get to optimal state. And the example there would be identity. And let's say they uh, started their journey with Duo or another multi-factor but they haven't added device posture, hygiene into uh, identity from a zero trust standpoint, that would be a great place for them to start. Uh, the last thing I'll, I wanna mention here is uh, when we're looking at changes in trust, Oxada said it best the other day when I was talking to her, uh, you really wanna start with manual processes, work through those workflows, uh, and then be able to set up the automation and orchestration to match the way that humans uh, would do that. So that's another area where you start kind of small and then you grow uh, the orchestration automation capabilities for response over time. I, I think that's a, a great point, especially that oftentimes you see as automation is seen as this, you know, not necessarily for the developer community because it's kind of where their bread and butter, but for the you know, security analyst, it's seen as this kind of foreign concept and trying to build that alignment back to the processes and things that they're already doing and just building, driving that efficiency um, from there. So I think that's all the time that we have for questions right now, kind of running right up to the hour. Um, Christy, I will pass it over to you. And if we do have any questions that come in at the last minute that we're not able to answer, um, we'll follow up from there. But thank you.